Welcome to the second part of um, our series about the neutron. In this video, I'm going to talk about the functions which are hiding under um, the hood of the oscillator section here to the left. I basically use the same setup with the MIDI controller and the neutron itself, but um, I add a USB connection here, you see it, I hope, at least, here, over there, and uh, a USB connection to my computer. Um, I add this uh, to uh, the setup so that I'm able to um, show you the, the, the waveforms and the frequencies and the spectra and the frequency connections which are uh, and at relations which are important without having to use a hardware oscilloscope, which I will use in later videos concerning the neutron. I'm going to use only oscillator 2 for the next few minutes and turn the mix knob completely to the right to oscillator 2, therefore. First thing to find out is the frequency range of the tuning knobs. I turn the tuning knob of oscillator 2 completely to the deepest frequencies, completely to the left, therefore, and open the VCA bias to get sound. Okay, so we see that um, here in the spectrum that the actual frequency here is at 63 hertz. So now I turn up the tuning knob, the tuning potentiometer, slowly turning it to um, the right to higher frequencies. Here we are at one octave more, one octave higher, second octave higher, and even a little bit more than two octaves. Let me show it in um, the frequency in numbers, the frequency we have reached right now. And it's around 287, 290 hertz. So we are talking about three semitones more than just two octaves. So the whole array frequency range is two octaves plus about three semitones. Let me try the same with the other basic ranges. We have eight foot now, uh, now a 16. All right, I hit a higher key to start at 63 hertz. Turn the frequency knob up, the tuning knob up, and we see it's the same. Okay, let me try it even with 32. Hitting a higher key, so we are again at 63. Starting frequency, turning the knob up, and we see it's the same. It won't be the same with a full range uh, mode of uh, the oscillator. So. Now we are at full range and we see, I will talk, it, uh, talk about this in detail a little bit later, um, we get sub-audio frequencies. The whole spectrum of audible frequencies and we can make the oscillator oscillate even at frequencies far higher than audible. You may ask, what are frequencies which are so high that I can't hear them good for? The answer is simple. Use them to modulate other modules. I turn the mix knob up so that we can hear both oscillators. Alright, now I use oscillator 1 to modulate oscillator 2. Oscillator 1 will modulate oscillator 2. But before I do so, I tune both oscillators to frequencies which are above audibility.
So, we don't hear anything because the frequencies are too high. Now, I let oscillator 1 modulate oscillator 2. I have to use the patch bay to do so. So, you won't see this at the moment. And suddenly, there is something audible again. Two frequencies, both too high to be audible, modulating each other, may, uh, will from time to time result in audible frequencies. All right. Uh, there is going to be a whole video about uh, the patch bay and about patching later in this series. I just turned the VSC bias down a, a little bit. All right. Um, and if you're interested in this video about pat the patch bay and patching, uh, well, m become a member of uh, the row film of our Rofil minus MediaNet community. This video, this what you are watching right now, is the last public one of this series. Just follow the link down, down <laughs> in the description um, to learn how to become a member. Um, yes, and as you see, here we have some typical radio sounds. Um, if you want to know how, if you know, uh, want to know why that happens, that two frequencies both being too high to be audible, um, but when um, modulating each other will lead to audible results. Well, there is a workshop. It's a public one, a public workshop, uh, workshop about it um, on this channel. It's a called Workshop FM and PM. The explanation would exceed the matter of this video by far. The lower end of the frequencies, especially the sub-audio frequencies, may for example serve as trigger impulses with a square wave and a short pulse with um, meaning a low duty cycle, meaning a short positive peak. So let me switch to square wave. Reduce the duty cycle. And here we have trigger impulses. Yeah, which I can quite flexible manage. I can modulate them and, and so on and so on. All right. Let me switch to <clears throat> Eight stop the, to the eight stop register again. Um, the question now reads: Which are the lowest and uh, highest frequencies I can play at uh, each frequency range? So I've chosen the eight stop uh, register. I turn the uh, tuning potentiometer completely to the left, as uh, <laughs> to the right, of course. <laughs> completely to the right, to the high frequencies, and I start playing up the keyboard. Octave up, octave up, octave up, octave up. So, oh, it seems... Yeah, this is the highest frequency, and it is at... Uh, all right, it's uh, exactly at uh, 4698 hertz, which uh, I reduce the volume a bit, um, which um, is um, a D8 in English notation, which corresponds to a MIDI note number 110. The manual says that the highest possible MIDI note is 96 by default. Well, we can change this, of course, by tweaking um, the configuration of the neutron, but uh, this is not a matter in this video. Um, but 
What is it? Is it, one, is it the MIDI note 110? Is it the MIDI note 96, which is the maximum note I can reach? Well, it is 96, but 96, MIDI note 96, at middle position of the potentiometer, is a frequency of uh, measured exactly, it's uh, um, a frequency of 2093 hertz, which is C7 in English notation and which corresponds indeed to MIDI note 96. So the MIDI note range um, is related to the middle position of the tuning knob. Okay. The lowest frequency you can reach by playing um, is at the lower border of audibility uh, with the tuning potentiometer turned completely to the left and this time it's really to the left. <laughs> so, I reduce the number of octaves. Yeah. So it's maybe something with 8 hertz or six, perhaps 16 hertz, it doesn't matter. Um, it's uh, without um, practical use talking about melodies and things like that. Um, yeah, it's uh, MIDI note number 24 in middle position. I get the uh, correct frequency of MIDI note um, 24, which is a C1 with a frequency of um, 32.7, yes, 32.7 hertz. Yeah, and we see it here. Yeah, will be. Yeah, it is, exactly. Okay, the whole playable um, range of MIDI notes without turning um, the tuning potentiometer uh, per, per register is therefore six octaves from C1, MIDI note number 24, to C7, MIDI note number 96. Okay, um, well, let me make it quick and short now. The highest reachable frequency as at the 16th stop register here is 2349.32 Hertz, or a D7, and at the register um, stop regi register 32. It's once again half the frequency, which is 1174.66 or D6. So interesting is the overall um, frequency distance between the stop registers is uh, one octave. Well, of course it is. Let me, but nevertheless, let me demonstrate this with a higher note. Let's say this one. Oh, sorry. Put it up. So what you see here the basic frequency jumps from octave to octave. All right. Yeah, uh, the lowest re the lowest reachable frequency with all six stop registers, uh, all three um, stop registers, is at the lower border of audibility. Just by the way, um, these highest and lowest frequencies are the same when using pure CV uh, con um, control voltage instead of five pole MIDI connection. Well, last matter concerning frequencies and tuning for today is using the LFOs, yes, the LFOs, LEDs, for correctly tuning the neutron to a C note. First, I choose an appropriate uh, frequency range and, well, yes, 8 is okay, um, to switch into a tuning mode, I have to press and hold the range button of the oscillator I want to tune. So I've turned the oscillator mix completely to the left, 
to oscillator 1 because at first I want to tune oscillator 1. Look at this LED. Now it starts flashing and I'm in tuning mode. Now I hit a key on the keyboard and um, the neutron will help me um, to tune this oscillator to the nearest C, meaning if I hit this A, it would help me, the, the uh, neutron would help me to tune it to this C. If I hit, for example, this um, uh, E flat, the neutron would help me to tune it, the oscillator, to this C. So, all right, let's go for it. I hit this. And now I have to turn the tuning knob until these LEDs, from these LEDs, only the descending saw wave is lit. Yeah, and here we are. Let's control. Let's control the monitor. Yeah, it's about 129, 120, no, 130, 130, and 131, 132 uh, is exactly C3. And I've, I'm looking at, it, at uh, um, a sheet here and I see it's 130.8 is C3. All right, I push the range button again. Oh. Stop. Yeah, now we are here. Now we're here. Now I want to tune oscillator number two and I want to tune it at first pressing the range button until it's flashing. I want to tune it to a higher C, so why not <coughs> at once hitting the C on the keyboard to this C. And you see I have to reduce the frequency Yeah, and here we are. And, oh wonder, oh wonder, I'm exactly one octave higher, as I see here in the oscillator, uh, or oscilloscope. All right. I leave the tuning mode. Okay, of course I can tune, um, that's clear, that's not a special function, I can tune uh, one of the oscillators to intervals using, to other intervals, uh, using um, here the signal analyzer and the frequencies. If I have a sheet like this, can you see it, telling me the frequencies of the single notes. Okay, members of um, the Rofilm minus Media Net community will have this sheet, of course. Well, the waveforms then. We saw and heard that we can smoothly morph between the different waveforms, between uh, consecutive waveforms. We saw this in the last video in video number one. And I would like to have some fun and patch a patch, a patch, a patch, it's nice, to set up a patch um, with the LFO modulating the changing of the waveforms, but in different directions. All right, let's go for it then. Well, what do I need? I need the LFO. I need the LFO's signal two times. Once for oscillator 1 and once for oscillator 2. So I patch the LFO out to the multiple in. But I reduce the bias a bit. Then I patch multiple out one 
to the shape one of oscillator one. And now I patch multiple two out at first to invert in and then invert out to shape two. Back to serious work. The morph mode is a great feature for designing sound, <clears throat> but sometimes you might want to jump from wave shape to wave shape, jumping instead of morphing. Um, well, let me switch the neutron to jump mode then. I press and hold the range button and after a while the paraphonic button starts blinking, I can release the range button then. And pressing the paraphonic button makes the uh, neutron jump to jump mode. <laughs> yeah, okay. So, look at that. Morphing. Pressing the button, the paraphonic button. And... We jump again and pressing again. I'm back to morph mode. Jump mode. And morph mode. But let me switch to jump mode and set jump mode. I can leave this um, jumping to and fro just by pressing the range button again until nothing is blinking anymore. So please realize that um, I can choose different modes, jump and morph modes, for these two oscillators. Right now oscillator 2 is in jump mode, whereas oscillator 1 is still in morph mode. So this widens the palette of possibilities, the spectrum of possibilities for designing sound, of course. But I leave oscillator 2 in uh, jump mode now, because I want to um, have a more detailed look at the individual waveforms now. When we jump from uh, wave shape to wave shape, we discover that some shapes deliver a higher volume than others. Sine and triangle are less loud than saw, square and stone mod. Alright, let's be clear now um, about the patching. Right now, as well as most of the time in this video so far, the sound from the oscillators goes um, into the filter and from the filter I've patched it directly into the VCA. Well, the filter is wide open, so let me go to the saw wave. So the filter is wide open. And you might think it won't have, this filter uh, won't have any influence on the sound, therefore, but you are mistaken. I will patch the oscillator's output now um, directly into the VCA, shortcutting um, not only the overdrive, but also the filter this time. So, I take the output from oscillator 2, I'm working with oscillator 2 at the moment, and patch it into the VCA, and we see it gets even louder. And not only that the sound gets louder, the edges in the waves um, are also a bit less smooth. So, let's look at the pure, the clean wave shapes now, 
as they come directly out of the oscillators and compare them uh, with those uh, going through the completely opened filter. We are at, uh, with, uh, at uh, Solveig at the moment, so... Let's go to square wave. Sorry. And to tell mod. triangle. Here the difference is not that big. But there is a difference in loudness at least. And the same with the sine wave. It is louder, yes. Not that much, but it is louder. But the shape the difference in the shape is nearly zero, nearly no difference. Okay. First there is this nice and warm sounding analog sine wave. It can develop a lot of sonic power. Let's start a sequence. Especially when I use both oscillators. Turn up the mix knob. and detune the oscillators slightly against each other. All right. Let's turn it. Oscillator one down again. Stop the sequence. The triangle wave, let's skip to the triangle wave. Yeah, the triangle wave, it's the cleanest of all ones, of all waves here of the neutron, but no wonder, because the triangle wave is the wave which all other wave shapes are derived from. The oscillator generates a triangle wave and manipulates it into sine or saw or square or a, to uh, a tone mod wave according to the shape mod, mod to the choice you have made using the shape mod knob. Um, please look at the spectrum. You see wonderfully this typical sine wave structure with every second partial being lower, carrying less energy than its neighboring ones. First, second, third, fourth, and so on, and so on. Let's go to the saw wave. And I will use the bias a bit. And the volume. Um, the saw wave reminds me most um, of uh, the vintage Oberheim synths. Um, it's mighty, it's dirty between each of the regular partials we see, and here a lot of analog noise. Here you see between the main partials there are smaller ones, it's analog dirt, which we won't have in digital synths. I play a deeper note. Oh, sorry, the deeper I said. Yeah. yeah, and this wave delivers a lot of, um, uh, not a lot of, sorry, d 
delivers uh, wonderful sonic uh, material, sonic raw material for filtering and, and other methods of messing up the spectrum, which I'm going to talk about uh, in later videos in this series. But let me come to the first wave, which can undergo a pulse width modulation, the square wave. The basic square wave of the neutron's uh, oscillator delivers a spectrum and so a sound that resembles the sound of, well, yes, Emerson, Lake and Palmer a lot and especially with frequencies around 200 Hz. I'm strongly reminded of LPs like, for example, Targus. Oscillator. Oscillator one down again. Let's have a look at the pulse width potentiometer in the lower section of the oscillator module. As we know from the last video, um, pulse width, um, the pulse width knob sets the duty cycle of the square wave. Turning the knob from right, let's go to the rightmost position. Slowly over 12 o'clock position to the left, we get duty cycles from about, let's say, 85%. Look here at the, spe at, um, the oscillator. This part of the cycle, I think it's about 85% of the whole cycle, perhaps even more. Um, Duty cycles from 85% over 50% at 12 o'clock position. So both, both parts of the cycle are equally long. And when I continue turning it to the left until I reach the leftmost position, I get only peaks. Very small UD cycles, nearly zero, only peaks. It's a little bit different with different frequencies. I leave it to the leftmost position. And here the peaks are a, bit, a little bit um, louder, but back to the higher frequencies. Please, Watch the spectrum, it's the upper screen here. And you see, uh, while I change the pulse width, at certain positions the partials organize themselves in groups of three or four, sometimes five partials, which build, let me say, kind of null, um, a little hill. Let's come to the so-called tone mod shape. You see, this shape is kind of a square wave folded back into itself. And um, here the formerly mentioned groups of partials in the spectrum are even more obvious. I go down to some lower frequencies. Here you see these groups of four, up to three, sometimes five partials. Um, we might say with some right that the spectrum suggests that the tone mod shape here 
is the result of extremely manipulating the duty cycle of a square wave, or to say it in an even more provocative form, we see here, uh, let's say, through zero pulse rhythm modulation, a term in itself is nonsense, of course, just to borrow the term from the field of frequency modulation. But let me engage the pulse width knob even here with this wave shape. Starting at the rightmost position of this knob, we get a square wave. We get a square wave with nearly double the number of cycles compared with the square, with the real square shape. Let's show it. The real square. And now tone mod with the um, pulse width module, um, pulse width knob completely to the right. And uh, watching the spectrum, we see indeed that the fundamental, the partial, which uh, normally determines the pitch in the sound, is not the loudest anymore. You see here, this is the partial. And here are at least two louder partials. Um, some of the higher partials representing higher octaves carry more energy than the fundamental. Turning the pulse width knob slowly to the left to its uh, 12 o'clock position, every second cycle gets dominant and the fundamental regains its former height, its former loudness, loudness its former energy. And continuing even further to the left until I reach the leftmost position of the pulse width knob, we have our good old square wave again. All right then, let's leave the wave shapes and turn our attention to some additional functions of the oscillator module. First, heart sync. A short explanation may serve well, as perhaps not all of you are familiar with the meaning of the term heart sync. The principle is simple. There are two oscillators, one of which works as a so-called master, the other one works in slave mode, meaning always when the master oscillator starts a new cycle, the slave oscillator is forced to start a new cycle as well, no matter if it has finished its own cycle or not. There are two meaningful situations possible. The master runs at a higher frequency than the slave and the master runs at a lower frequency than the slave. If the master runs at a higher frequency, the slave never finishes even a single of its cycles. If the master runs at a lower frequency, then the slave finishes one or more cycles before, somewhere in the middle of its next cycle, it is forced to start a new cycle from the beginning. There are a lot of interesting aspects, a lot of certain interesting frequency relations and so on, but as this is not a hard sync tutorial, the mentioned short facts shall be sufficient for today. Pushing the oscillator sync button makes oscillator 1 act as the master and oscillator 2 act as the slave. Oscillator 1 hard syncs oscillator 2. I start with um, the master's frequency being higher than the slave's frequency. So here is the slave's frequency, and now here is the master's frequency. Back to the slave's frequency, pushing the heart sync button. And here we are. <clears throat> we see how oscillator 2 is forced, oscillator 2 is forced to begin its cycle anew, even before having finished a single cycle here at the oscilloscope. The cycle is not finished, but has to start anew. Please notice that uh, the oscillator mix, I think I mentioned it already, is turned completely to the left. We hear only oscillator 2 at the moment, only the slave. Let me 
try different frequencies. Now I change the master's wave shape and we see that it doesn't matter. Of course it doesn't. We don't hear oscillator 1, we hear only oscillator 2 here. And oscillator 1 sends, always when it uh, starts a new cycle, it sends a hard sync signal to oscillator 2 and always when it finish uh, when it starts a new cycle doesn't matter what shape the cycle has let me now change the slave's shape to watch different hard synced wave shapes triangle saw Duty cycles. Turn the sine wave shape. Uh, I return to the sine wave shape, and um, well, I now reduce the frequency of the master of oscillator one and increase the frequency of oscillator two, the slave, until it is higher than the master's frequency. And now we see that control, this is now, we hear and see the frequency of oscillator 2, the slave. Let's return to the master and we see it's lower. And now the, the, uh, the slave is able to um, finish, to complete some cycles before it's forced to begin anew again. Let's look here at the oscilloscope. One complete cycle, two complete cycles, and here it's forced again before completing this third cycle. Even this with different wave shapes of the slave. Okay, let me play around with the frequency a bit. In paraphonic mode, both oscillators can play notes independently from each other. We can play two different notes, notes or two different melodies at the same time, therefore. To activate this mode, uh, simply, I simply push the paraphonic button. So. Normal mode.
in paraphonic mode. All right. <clears throat> nice. Uh, useful as well. And, um, but there is an important question to answer. Which oscillator plays which note? Please don't forget that both oscillators can contribute completely different sounds. They can deliver different wave shapes. Right at the moment they do. Here is the square wave and here is the triangle. But they can be patched differently as well. One oscillator can be patched through uh, the delay and the overdrive, or the other one can be patched only through the filter, and one can be patched through the filter, the other one not, and so on. So the question, which oscillator plays which note, is important, therefore. Well, the answer is, it depends on the note priority mode, the neutron is switched to. I'll change the melodies and choose different waves, even more different waves. At first, different waves. Let's say here, sine, and here, tone mod, um, just to be able to tell apart the contribution to the whole sound of each oscillator. Let me change the melody now. Use another pattern. Let's see this one. Let's have a look. Yeah, good too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, good too. Good too. Good too. Good too. All right. Um, the synth right now is switched to a low note priority. I see this when I press the oscillator sync button and hold it until these two buttons start blinking and then we see here in i hope we do in just a moment i think yes yes we see it um i've controlled the camera <laughs> the camera window um we see it here in the the filter section the lower led is blinking means the os the the, um, the neutron is in low uh, note priority mode i press it again so, low note priority mode. So, let's, look at, let's, have a, let's have a look at the pattern. The pattern starts with a single C4, which, you will hear it in a moment, is played by both oscillators, of course. If there is only one note, both oscillators, even in paraphonic uh, mode, play both notes. Then, a C6 on a high note, steps in after a quite short time. Oscillator 1 grabs it and plays it, forcing oscillator 2 to continue playing C4. When the G5 appears, oscillator 1 is still playing the C6, so that oscillator 2 can play the new note, the G5, and so on. Let me demonstrate it. I start the pattern. Perhaps I. Ah, oh, no, that's okay. I make this the C6 shorter so that I can make it start later. So at first, both play C4. Oscillator 1, Oscillator 2, and so on. Okay. All right. With high note priority, it's <clears throat> the same. Everything is simply a question of which oscillator is free to grab the new note. I switch to high note priority, pushing oscillator sync, waiting for these others, other um, buttons to start blinking, changing the mod button to high 
note priority, pressing it again to get rid of the blinking. All right, let me start with the pattern and you'll see it's completely the same like before. Okay, but it's different with the last note priority mode. Once again, I change to it, pressing oscillator sync. Once pressing mode, now the middle LED is blinking. Pressing it again to get rid of the blinking. Now we are in, um, in last uh, note priority mode. Uh, don't bother this uh, LED, the low pass filter LED blinking um, a lid, because we are not in mode choose um, setup now. Once again, pressing oscillator sync, and you see the neutron indicates we are in last note priority mode. So. Let me start the pattern now. And you see, both oscillators start playing the deep C4 at first, of course they do. But then it's oscillator 2 which grabs and plays the new note, the high C6. And the same thing happens when the G5 note sets in. Again, it's oscillator 2 which plays it, whereas oscillator 1 changes to playing the high C6 note, and so on. Well, oscillator FM now. I'm not going down the FM rabbit hole today. Um, I don't want to last this video days instead of only an hour or so. But we need to know whether the neutron delivers exponential FM or linear FM. In other words, whether the frequency deviation of the carrier oscillator upwards from the base frequency is the same as downwards measured in octaves or measured in hertz. You will remember that an octave up means double the frequency measured in hertz and an octave down means half the frequency measured in hertz. Well, I patch the output of oscillator 1 into an attenuator. I use attenuator 1. And the output of attenuator 1 into the input of oscillator 2. I've reduced um, the modulators, oscillators, uh, oscillator 1, uh, the modulators frequency to sub-audio level to be able to measure the uh, frequency deviations. But just to demonstrate, I put it up. Well, um, with the attenuator, I can regulate how far the deviation shall reach or reduce it. So we have a deviation from one octave up and one octave down. So we see that the neutron delivers exponential frequency modulation. The difference between the base frequency and um, the utmost fre uppermost frequency is one octave the same as downwards one octave. And even if I increase the modulation, the strength of modulation by turning up the attenuator, 
The differences, upwards and downwards, stay the same in octaves, but of course not in hertz. We have exponential frequency modulation. There are two more functions to show and talk about. But before I do so, I'd like to, and indeed I need to, talk about support. I've published more than 200 videos like this one concerning music, sound, sound design, music production and gear on three different channels. There are more than 50 hours of additional tutorial videos available as donationware. If I'm to continue my work and to sustain the quality, I depend on your support. The least you can do, if you like this video, is, well, liking and subscribing and sharing this video to your social media and talking about it to your friends. This is important for me. I thank you for doing so and please hear me honestly saying in advance thank you very much indeed. But at the bakers and at the butchers and with my landlord, a large number of likes and subscribers won't really help, unfortunately. So, if you'd like to support my work a bit more, you may visit my website www.rofilm-media.net and donate an amount of your choice. And again, wow, great, really, thank you in advance. And perhaps you want to help me and yourself even a bit more. If it is so, well then, consider getting a member of our Rofil Minus Medianet community. You'll find it on my website as well. As a member, you will have access to all donationware videos I mentioned above, including future ones, and, ta-da, big thing, you'll have free access to Modular City as well. Let me say it again. Thank you for at least listening to me. All right, back to the neutron now. The last two functions I'm going to talk about today don't directly concern the oscillator module, but they are hiding under the front panel of the oscillator module. And so, please look at the lower right corner of the patch bay. You'll find an output jack there, which is called a sign. You can choose between five sources which uh, shall feed this output. These five possible sources are oscillator 1 control voltage and oscillator 2 control voltage, the node on velocity of a MIDI node, the mod wheel of your MIDI keyboard and the aftertouch signal coming from your MIDI keyboard. To see which of these sources is actually connected to the assigned jack or to change the source, um, we have to press and hold the oscillator sync button again, as we did with the node priority, but this time let's not look at the filter LEDs, but at the wave shape LEDs in the LFO section. The blinking LED tells us the actual choice with the following meanings. A flashing sign shape LED means oscillator 1 control voltage is connected to the sign output jack. A flashing triangle shape LED means oscillator 2 control voltage. A flashing descending saw shape LED means node on velocity. A flashing square shape LED means mod wheel and a flashing saw shape LED means aftertouch. Okay, let's find out then. I push the oscillator sync button until everything starts blinking and we see uh -huh, actually the assign output jack is connected to oscillator 1 control voltage. To change this I push one of these buttons to go forward. I push this one, look at this, these LEDs. And to go backwards I push the other one. I want to assign my mod wheel um, to the assign um, output jack. 
here, therefore, to the square wave shape. Now I take patch cable and patch the assign output jack, for example, to the resonance of my filter. filter residence. Well, last function for today now, and uh, it is the envelope re-triggering function. I think I should explain the meaning of this term first. If the envelope re-triggering is off, as it is at the moment, uh, which is, by the way, the, defa the default situation, uh, when you switch on um, the neutron uh, a new envelope is triggered only if no key on your keyboard is pushed when you play the next one. In other words, playing and holding a key when playing the next one won't make the envelope start again and you might well ask yourself, hey, why don't I hear what I'm playing? Let me demonstrate this. I've adjusted the um, um, sustain of zero and let's say, a middle long decay. So, and where, while I am, I can play some notes. Here. But when I play a note, I use the other hand, I think you can see it better then. Um, when I play a note and hold it, and play the next one while holding the first one, the following happens. Let's make the decay a bit longer. So this E flat doesn't re-trigger the envelope as long as I hold this C. All right. Of course, I can switch envelope re-triggering on. And how to achieve that? Well, we have to push and hold the oscillator sync button, like always in the last minutes. Um, so, or well, everything is blinking. But now, um, may I lead your interest to this little sweet button called key track. If key track is not lit, no envelope re-triggering uh, re as we have found out. Now I push this key track button. It is lit now. And now, look at that. You see, even if, even when, uh, while holding, sorry, even while holding one note, I can play the next one. And the envelope is re-triggered. So if this key track button is lit, I can even, even uh, switch this mode off. Then envelope re-triggering is on. All right. I hope you have enjoyed this video. And um, thank you for watching it. Enjoy your day. Rolf.